Rudy, thank you. I, uh, I spent my life as a music minister uh, in a church, uh, four of them actually over time. Uh, nothing moves me more than really great music. And the thing that I appreciate, uh, Rudy, about what you did, I don't know where you are now, but there you are back there. Uh, when it's done really well, it makes a really big difference. I've been around an awful lot of music in my life that wasn't done very well. <laughs> Much of it I'd produced myself. And uh, I, I, uh, I just get blessed and, and I, I threw my notes out. Uh, I just decided I'm going to just talk about something different today. I, uh, I, I, told, um, I told Zach about a week ago that I was really struggling with uh, what I would talk to you about today. I, uh, uh, I just really couldn't put my finger on it and I, I got three things that I started with and uh, two of them got thrown out and I brought the, the third one with me today and it's getting thrown out. I, I just really feel like based on what we've been through in worship this morning, I ought to just change what it is I wanted to say. I want to include a little bit of what's on my notes. But um, you know, when I was driving down here this morning, I thought, you know, God, Paul, just stick with the notes. Just don't get off on a bunny trail somewhere. And here I am on a bunny trail. So I, I just have to kind of count on the Lord to, to speak uh, through us and to us this morning about... Um, about what he would have. And I, I guess my prayer is, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Let me also tell you, and I might as well explain, that um, whenever I speak in the last maybe five years, I, I got old somewhere along the line. I, anybody appreciate that? I, yeah. I, I don't know what happened. One day I was 40, and the next day I was 75. And I, I, I just really don't know what happened, but I got old. And one of the things that happened to me as I got old is I got to the place where I would rather consistently break down. I actually get choked up at commercials on television. It's just that ridiculous. Uh, and yet, you know, and, and I, I was asked to do something at my church in, in uh, Lake Elsinore, and I declined simply because I don't think I could get through it without breaking down. So you just have to, ahead of time, let me just ask you to forgive me if I get kind of choked up once in a while. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. It's just the nature of who I am. I got old. I don't know what to tell you. I can you know, only excuse, excuse I can make. Uh, I, I want to just tell you a couple stories about myself and tie it into what I think the Lord is asking me to tell you this morning, and I hope it turns out to be meaningful to somebody. Um, I realize, and I think you realize, that I don't know very, any of you really well. And, and to be able to speak to you out of my heart to your heart is just not possible unless the Spirit says something. And so I'm just kind of counting on the Spirit to do something through me to somebody in this room today that maybe can relate. I grew up in what I call a professional Christian home. Does anybody old enough to re remember Charles E. Fuller's Old Fashioned Revival Hour? Very few of us remember, but you know, we're old enough to remember. It covered 90% of the globe on the radio. He was on the radio for 40 years. Uh, I was privileged to sing in the choir in the very last days of the Old Fashioned Revival. We were in a studio in Los Angeles by then. But he used to hold a rally at the Long Beach Civic Auditorium, which many years ago was torn down and now the, the, the uh, the, the front uh, in Long Beach is completely different now. You wouldn't recognize it anymore. But we drove from Santa Barbara down, and I often went with my dad, and we'd sit backstage at the Old Fashioned Revival Hour in Long Beach, and we would have a contest between the children. My dad was in the quartet. There was a four boys quartet, and then there was a choir, and they sang, and they had a big crowd every Sunday, and Dr. Fuller would speak. And uh, we would sit backstage at that, that uh, event, and we would uh, wait to see. We had little bets between us, the, the children of the quartet members, little bets between us as to who could see Leland Green, the choir director, smile first. None of us ever won. There was just something about the guy. He just never smiled. I don't know what happened, but we kept watching. That's about what we got out of those, those mornings. And it's too bad because the truth is we weren't listening. 
uh, I grew up in that home, and, and I remember my dad uh, would, if I would come home with something exciting, I wanted to, to have him know. Uh, he would say, lower your voice, Paul. I'm right here. I can hear you. And of course, that would take all the steam out of my story. And then they'd spend the rest of the breakfast trying to convince me to tell my story, and I was having no part of it. I grew up in that kind of a home. When I was 14 years old, I was the song leader in our church. Most of you don't understand song leaders anymore. But we actually waved our hand and ran back and forth on the platform and led the singing on Sunday night. Anybody have a Sunday night service anymore at your church? Every once in a while I see a church that has a Sunday night service. We had one every Sunday. Uh, I, I remember that uh, I used to tell people I went to church five times a week when I was still in the oven. Uh, my mom was in church five times a week. I was, I was the president of our youth group. I, I grew up in all of that. I was 16 years old before I finally realized what was going on in my life. There was a speaker at the Youth for Christ club meeting at our high school. Uh, anybody remember Youth for Christ? You know, it's been around a while. It's still around in some cities. I remember he talked about it, and the story that he told in, that, in that, that talk that day was God doesn't have grandchildren. And all of a sudden it hit me. Wait a minute. I'm God's grandchild. And I, I, I remember I, I, was, I, I was led to the Lord in the latrine at the boys club in Santa Barbara. I was right next to the toilet. But that's where I, I really met the Lord. And then my life proceeded over a period of time, and I got to the place where I just realized I was very, very, very far from God. Uh, I was probably in my 30s by then, and maybe some of you can relate to all of that. I, I, my life went on, and, and uh, I, I got back with the Lord, and I got a job as the minister of music at a church in Los Angeles. I got married for the second time, and this one's lasted for 45 years. I think we might make it. <laughs> My father-in-law never did give me permission to marry his daughter. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I remember when I, I did their 50th wedding anniversary celebration, my mom and dad, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, and uh, I thought I was going to be cute. So they asked me to do a, a devotional for this celebration. There was probably as many people in the room as this, maybe a few more. And uh, I remember I looked down at my father-in-law and I said, you know, Dad, you never did give me permission to marry your granddaughter. And he just sat there. The whole place got the point, and they began to laugh, and it sort of took the steam out of whatever it was I said after that. There we were, and 45 years later, we're still married, and we're still reasonably happy. We, we certainly belong with each other. My wife is a blessing from God for me. The, as my life went on, I went to, I, I, I went to, uh, I, I got to the end of a, of a job in Los Alamitos up here by Seal Beach, and and uh, uh, I lost the job to a merger. Our church merged with another church, and the other guy was younger, and they asked me if I would leave and let him be the music minister. And I thought, and they offered me a very big severance package. I was kind of impressed, and, and I thought, man, this is great. I'll get a job next week, and, 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 and I'll just put all that money in the bank. And, and uh, 17 months later, I just still didn't have a job. I remember I drove a tow truck at night and I cleaned swimming pools in the daytime. One of the kind of blessings that has turned out from that is my kids seem to think that that 17 months was the best 17 months of their lives. I still don't know why they feel that way, but they did. My sons learned to work. I mean, we worked hard to try to stay alive in those days. And then we got a job in Merced, California, and for 26 years we served as music minister in a church. And then I got a call one more. I, we, we lost that job. Uh, the, pastor, uh, the pastor changed and, and uh, uh, the new pastor came in and he just sat me down and he told me that he would not have hired me if he had been the pastor of that church. And I thought, well, with a vote of confidence like that, I suppose I should quit. I, was, I did community service for, for a few years. I worked in a number of, of capacities. And then one day I got a call. And believe it or not, I'm actually getting around to the point I feel like the Lord is asking me to help make with you this morning. The call came and the, 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 the gentleman on the phone said, we would like to know if you would consider being the pastor of our church. Now you understand, I've been a music minister all my life. 
I, I learned to memorize the words, and that's about as close to, to anything creative that I ever did. Something in me began to tell me, uh, you need to take this job, Paul. And I said, okay. And I think I shocked the guy who called me. I'm not sure he had talked to his board or had had a, a <coughs> church vote or anything like what had been my experience in the past. But I remember hanging up the phone, and I remember immediately popped into my mind 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now let me do a little parenthesis. I think I would have been comfortable in Corinth. Corinth was the kind of a city where the Apostle Paul had to constantly say to the people of Corinth, you've got to get your act together. You've got to make sure you don't get off the beaten path somewhere. And I feel like that would have been very... Uh, commonplace for me to live. I would have been very comfortable there. But what the Apostle Paul said in his first letter, in the first chapter of that letter, he said, God uses the weak and the foolish to confound the strong and the wise. And I remember hanging up the phone. I still to this day don't know where it came from. I just have to assume that it came from the Spirit of God. And I said, Lord, if you really are serious about using the weak and foolish to confound the strong and wise, I'm your guy. And I took the job, and I remember telling my wife hours later, I took the job as pastor of Atwater Baptist Church, and she said, you did what? She was shocked. You've been a singer all your life, Paul. You've never preached a sermon in your life. How are you going to be the pastor of a church? Not only was I going to be the pastor of the church, but the church had 35 people every Sunday who were all older than I am. They came to church every Sunday out of habit. And what one of their habits was they were really good at taking a nap between 11 and 12. <laughs> wow. I served that church for 11 years. I can tell you without fear of contradiction that I learned so much more from that 11 years than anybody in my congregation did that it had to be simply from the Lord. God uses the weak and the foolish to confound the strong and the wise. I didn't go to seminary. Actually, we kind of call it cemetery once in a while. I, I, I graduated from a Christian college, but uh, you know, I, I was really not a very good student. It took me five years to finish. I flunked out after my sophomore year, worked for a year, and then came back in summer school and earned my way back in and sort of floated through the last two years. My dad was a professor at that particular college, and I'm sure I got through the, the, the experience of college for, because my dad was there, and, and uh, somehow behind the scenes he managed to see to it that I graduated. I wasted my four years of college, and anybody who's thinking about going to college or has kids that's going to college, make sure you un they understand that you know this is serious stuff. You got to go to school. I think it was important, by the way, that that um, the Lord had worked in my. I have two sons, and both of them did not go to college right out of high school. Uh, one son went into the army, and the other son went off of the drum corps and played for four years on the road. And, and then they got jobs, and they got married, and they had uh, responsibilities. And they decided. To, my one son just decided, I've got to. I've got to get to college, and, and uh, I've got to, otherwise I'm not going to be able to get anywhere in life. And the other one decided that he had reached, he was doing well in his company, but he found out that he had a glass ceiling, and he had people flying by him who were being promoted beyond him who didn't know half of what he knew about the company, but they had college degrees. And so they both went back to school in a very short period of time. They finished with very high grades, and now they're doing really well. But uh, just make sure you tell your kids, you know, that... When you go to school, it's important to spend some time learning something. Amen. Back to the point. Here's the point, and I'm, I'm, I really, this is the point I want to make with you that I really will hope will, will be an impact on somebody. God decides to use the weak and the foolish to confound the strong and wise for a very, very specific reason. God has in mind that he's going to get the credit, and you're not. Amen. 
John Piper, I don't know if you know his name, he's a pastor in, uh, up in the northern part of the country, and he makes a statement that all true mission is really God on his mission. And God's mission is to get glory for himself, to extend the influence of his kingship over the world around him, and to reconcile the world to himself. Those three functions that, that he's going to accomplish through you has to do primarily with getting you out of the way. One of the things I think I have learned in my 77 years is that there is a sense in which God cannot be glorified when we are determined to be glorified. God wants to get the glory, he's going to get the glory, and it isn't going to have anything to do with you. I have a Bible study that I do at the Chateau up, on, up at Harveston Lake. It's a, a senior home. It, it, the, my mother-in-law lives there and she likes to say it's not assisted living, it's independent living. The truth is they take care of us as we get older. I don't live there, but I do this Bible study. Um, this morning I do it again. And we're in 1st and 2nd Samuel. And one of the things I'm learning as I walk through the stories in the Old Testament, uh, and I like to tell the people in my Bible study that it's his story. It's not just the history of the, of the Israeli people. It's who God is and how he functions. And over and over and over and over again, we discover that God causes things to happen in such a way that there is absolutely no question whatsoever that he did it and we didn't. And when we trust the heaven, our Heavenly Father, we find out that he works so that the glory comes to him. I think about it, I put this down. Suppose we t rewrote the Old Testament stories and suppose that Adam and Eve didn't spit out God's command and devour the forbidden fruit. Supposing Abraham didn't try to pass his wife off of his sister. Supposing Joseph's brothers didn't stab him in the back. Supposing Judah didn't hire his daughter-in-law in as a prostitute and impregnate her. Supposing David didn't have an affair with Bathsheba and kill her husband to get away with it. Supposing that's the way the stories were written. It would make an entirely different. But the truth is that all of those things happened for the single purpose of getting people out of the way so that God could get the glory. And you and I need to rep recognize that that's how it works. So I guess I would leave you with this thought. God uses the weak and the foolish to confound the strong and wise because the strong and wise need to hear the message that he's in control, he's in charge. And you and I need to understand that no matter what happens, no matter what kind of situations you get put in, you're going to get put in to a situation where God's going to get the glory. It's hard for us as men. I, I really wish I could look back on 40 or 50 years in ministry and say, boy, I did some wonderful stuff. The truth is I didn't. The truth is it didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out. It didn't come out getting uh, I, I would constantly uh, be, be throttled in my desire to get the credit. One of the things that, that I, I learned the hard way was when I got done with an individual job, and it happened twice in my life, I would be invited back um, six or eight weeks later to do something in that church. And I would discover that the program that I had been working on for 10 years had been revolutionized by the fact that I left. It was so much better when I came back. I remember I was asked to come back and do a, do a funeral for one of the members of my church when I had left Los Alamitos. And I came back and the choir was three times as large and it was singing a lot better than I'd ever caused it to sing. And I, I thought, how in the world does this happen? Same thing happened in Merced. I, I left First Baptist Church of Merced. I was gone for a while, and, and I was asked to come back and do a soliloquy. Uh, uh, I, they, they wrote a piece on Jonah, and I was to be Jonah and, and read this thing, and I was excited about being able to come back and do it. And I looked around me, and I thought, you know, the, the, the kid who took my place, I had a master's degree in music, and the kid who took my place had never conducted a choir in his life. And he was sitting in the orchestra playing guitar. 
and this huge production was going on and nobody was waving their hand and nobody was leading anything and yet everything was going like clockwork and ever there were there were 15 or 20 people involved that had been there the whole time I was there and had never been involved in anything I'd done and, and they were working hard and they were excited and God was blessing it and it was my, and I thought to myself what in the world happened God uses the weak and the foolish to confound the strong and the wise. Now, here's the message for you. When you think about the ministry that God has given you in your everyday life, I want you to think about the fact that God wants to use you regardless of how unqualified you may feel. What in the world can I contribute? What, in, what can I give? What can I do? What can I, it isn't about what you can do. And it seems to me that you and I need to pray every day. And I'm telling you, when I point a finger at you, there are three of them, four of them pointed right back at me. The biggest message I can give you today is God wants to use, especially those of you who have come to terms with the fact that you're weak and foolish. Mm. One of the hardest things I've had to learn in my 50 years of ministry is that most of the time I'm weak and foolish. I'd like to think there was something more. I've got a degree, I went to school, I was number one in my class and my master's degree. I, I can give you all kinds of reasons why I should feel strong. But what God really wants me to recognize is that I'm weak and I'm foolish and I don't do things the way I'm supposed to do them unless for some reason I give God the credit for it, unless I give him the chance to do what he wants to do. I guess what God has, has, what I'm beginning to hear in my heart, what God has asked me to do this morning, is to throw away all this and just simply say, guys, here I am. Amen. What you need to understand is that here you are. No matter how weak, no matter how foolish, no matter how unqualified you may feel to be the kind of man God wants you to be, God is exactly wanting to use you because you feel that way because you finally come to terms with something that took me 50 years to come to terms with. I've told a number of audiences recently that I, I really feel like the only way I can, I would love to go back and live my life over again. And the only way I can do that is to be able to speak into the lives of people who are younger than I am and say, don't make the mistakes I made. Just simply understand God wants to use the weak and the foolish to confound the strong and the wise. I just pray that that has a, some kind of a message, some kind of a, of, a, of a bell goes off in the mind of somebody or some group of somebody's in this room that can simply say, oh, I get it. God wants to use me specifically because I'm weak and foolish so that ultimately he'll get the credit. God, I thank you for the time we've spent together. I thank you for what you give us every day to, to work with. And yet, God, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be Lord of each of our lives. I want you to be able to do through us the kinds of things we could never have done with ourselves, even if we are uh, educated or, or prepared or somehow have gotten our act together. God, we just want you to be in full and complete control of everything we do. May God be glorified. May he be lifted up. May he be uh, able to do his work through us because we're out of the way and we're understanding that we just want to be tools in your hands. God, uh, uh, just bless whatever is, is, has gotten into the hearts of men today. Uh, thank you for being able to, to, to just simply share my heart with these guys. Um, God bless it and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.